Welcome to the first webinar of 2021 run by the Department of Rural Health, University of Otago and the Division of Rural Hospital Medicine. My name is Lucinda Thatcher and I have taken over the role of the CME coordinator. This evening we are going to discuss obstetric emergencies, which is a broad topic, but we're going to highlight some of the key aspects through PowerPoint and case-based discussion. Our two speakers this evening, Celia Devonish, she's a ONG specialist who lives in Fairley but works in Dunedin, is very involved in ONG training in the college and is very passionate not only about women's health, but rural health in general, living on a sheep and beef farm in Fairley. We also have Brendan Marshall, he's a rural generalist with significant postgraduate obstetric training, he lives and works on the west coast and in his spare time he's working through his masters. Here's our rural hospital medicine expert tonight, and he's going to bring the rural, hosp rural hospital medicine context here with his cases. Need to answer to anything else. Of course, being based rurally, you may be the first port of call for those who've had home births. At weekend on call, I had two home birth problems that presented to ED, um, one with massive bleeding and retained placenta, and the other with a very moribund baby with extreme meconium. I'm sure you see similar things and need to transport them further than I do from ED. So the PMMRC is our go-to for statistics and December 20 was the last statistics provided. And it shows that um, of the births, the poor outcomes um, are around 17 for maternal um, compromise and morbidity and death um, compared with 24 a decade ago. But it's very obvious in this country that there are women who um, suffer more, and that would be Māori and Pacifica. The causes of maternal mortality in this country are sadly 50% suicide. Some of it is during pregnancy, half of it, and half of it being um, during pregnancy. And that includes early pregnancy around first trimester and terminations, et cetera. Um, the other uncommonly high cause in New Zealand is amniotic fluid embolus, AFE, which is seven times higher than that in Australia, where you'd think it wouldn't be so different. And there is no clear explanation for it. There's no great difference in hypertonic patterns of labor or induction. And it's thought to be a blip in the statistics that will hopefully disappear. BTE features equally in most developed countries, but sepsis is something that has crept up again in the recent years. So um, I'm just going to show you a graph showing that the maternal mortality rate in UK compared with here, and Embrace is the study um, similar to PMMRC. And I don't expect you to read all this, but um, Clearly, um, New Zealand is in red and grey is UK. So we have a much higher suicide rate than the UK with a much bigger, more dense population. We have probably similar social deprivation, but obviously um, there's a very big difference. Maybe it's in maternal mental health services. And we have very similar causes of death from VTE, AFE and sepsis in our country. And altogether, the kind of um, slatted lines are about the total direct deaths in each country. And you'll see that per population, they are higher. And if we looked at the indirect deaths, they're much more similar with background problems with cardiac, neurological, and can I say that neurological does include the SUDEP thing, which is about the sudden unexplained death in epilepsy, um, not just because of changes in medication with Pharmac here in this country, but also in the UK, due to people either stopping or changing medication and not having levels managed. And you may experience some of these things yourselves in your localities. Non-obstetric sepsis is um, more evident in the UK. And 
basically, we are quite dissimilar populations these days, but I think we have quite marked differences in our major causes, which is a concern and hopefully remediable. But it's not all bad news because there has been, if you look at the um, dramatic fall in the three year rolling rate of um, maternal mortality ratios um, per ethnic group, you can see that there has been a fall overall in the last um, decades for Mari. And although there's been quite a blip in 2015 for um, non-Mari or New Zealand Europeans, they're, they're not so dissimilar now as they were, say, in 2008. So I guess the bottom line is that rare events occur anywhere, and it might be a pulmonary embolus happening during a pregnancy that presents to one of your units. Amniotic fluid embolus it occurs usually in labor, so that's more likely to happen in a primary unit, maybe in a grand multip who's got a very rapid, strong labor. Cerebral vein thrombosis happen, like in our statistics for our hospital, is once every two years we have one. And that presents with a headache, usually um, peripartum or postpartum. Subarachnoid bleeds, which are kind of set up to happen at some stage and may just happen in pregnancy. And then the trauma. So the motor vehicle accidents um, are not uncommon. Seat belts do tend to be um, worn a lot more now, we find. We had two at the weekend, um, which was interesting, one with a fractured tibia and fractured ribs. And she was 26 weeks and despite only going at 60K and rolling her car in a ditch, she did end up having a preterm birth and that 26 week is okay in the NICU at the moment. Um, the other trauma was um, less of a good outcome. So the important thing to remember about um, trauma and motor vehicle accidents is to remember to displace the uterus if you're trying to resuscitate because of the weight of a baby past 20 weeks gestation does mean that that's going to be difficult to get um, resuscitation successful for the mother. And suicidal gestations, um, this can be from you know, quite dramatic forms in pregnancy to taking overdoses of insulin or other medications. So let's talk about common things that you all see, such as bleeding in pregnancy and the risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage and the things that you might do to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. I realize that you can't do um, interactive talking, but I'd like you just to jot them down the risk factors for PPH. So if you get called to PPH, and that means that someone's probably appeared in your emergency room, we automatically look for the tone. And if there isn't tone, the most important thing is to evacuate the uterus of all the clot or whatever's in there, the placenta, if you can. It's a WHO standard which New Zealand midwives and medical professions have signed up to that if there is a retained placenta, you will attempt to remove it. So it is an expectation that you will try. If it's stuck, that's different. But you would do bimanual pressure and you would proceed to resuscitate as you know best. But to prevent it in the first place, of course, it's a good idea to give prophylaxis um, in the third stage with oxytocin, um, and this is usually an IM injection. There are some midwives who won't do this. With regard to ongoing management, we will talk about this shortly. And the causes of antipartum hemorrhage, if it's not trauma associated with MVAs or falling over downstairs, all the things that people do, um, it may be that it's a spontaneous abruption, which may have a background cause, anything from serious hypertension to thrombophilias. And being aware that the most dangerous thing for an APH is a hard, firm uterus that does not relax between contractions 
and there you may not even know there's contractions because it's so hard, the wooden uterus. And, and this is a sign that things are going to deteriorate quite quickly for the mother as well as the fetus. So just to recap stuff you probably do know is that, you know, there's quite a lot of blood going at term to the uterus. So you can, five minutes, you can lose an awful lot of your blood volume. BMI, of course, has an increased blood volume. You can lose two liters and remember blood on the floor means a liter or more for a PPH. But however much uterotonics you put in, if you don't empty out the clot that's already in the uterus by squeezing and being a bit unkind to the woman, um, you aren't going to get very far. So manual expression is important. And the most important thing from resuscitation aspects and understanding where the woman's at is because of her youth, she's going to compensate quite well as to weigh everything you can. In our unit, we have dry inconch sheets, dry towels, dry bedding. We know the weights of those so that when we weigh them, when they've got blood all over them, we know how much blood has been lost. As you know, it's very difficult to accurately estimate blood loss. You will know this without telling um, the things that people tend to forget are to start the MUSE chart and the urinary output with an IDC. And of course, emptying the bladder enables the uterus to contract so much more effectively. The bimanual uterine compression, you put your fist in the anterior fornix, not the posterior, and you fold the uterus down onto it like squashing an empty hot water bottle. Most of you will have some degree of blood access in the bigger units, um, but planning transfer and having an overall view of where you need to go and what time frame becomes quite important. I always remember seeing someone in a rural clinic who said, I, I want my wife to have a baby in Dunedin. I said, oh yeah. And he said, well, I'm an ambulance driver. And last month or so, I took someone to town and it took me a long time to wash out all the blood. And that was very revealing to me because I'd looked after the woman who had left the unit with a hemocue said to be something like 10 and had arrived with it about five and no one could establish where the blood had been. And it was because it was all in the back of the ambulance. So, just to be um, re reminding you that the painless bleeds tend to be the low percenters. It can bleed at any gestation, but mainly when the lower segment is beginning to cause a little bit of movement under the placenta with its growth as the cervix becomes part of the uterus. And that's a little bit like causing a shearing pressure, which causes a bleed, which is generally painless and can be a warning bleed followed by a torrent. The accidental bleeds from marginal sinuses or from placental separation become dangerous and potentially lethal when the uterus becomes hard and unrecognized. We talked about the causes and what you might be thinking of besides tone, trauma. Remember that uterus with a scar that dehisses or breaks down is also trauma tissue retained bits and pieces and used up coagulation factors. Not long ago, we had partial inversion of the uterus transferred. I was very grateful the helicopter took um, some uncross matched Oneg blood with them due to intuition, no doubt. And the lady was transferred. And when she arrived in EED and got straight up to theater, She'd had her blood units. She was quite unwell and flat. And we saw um, hanging out what looked to be like a, a, a merino possum beanie, which was an inside out uterus. And there had been an attempt in, um, on part of not, not the helicopter crew, but of the people looking after her initially to um, remove the placenta and they hadn't realized that 
they had actually caused a partial inversion, but then became a complete inversion. And the reason for her profound collapse was because of the inversion. It was very difficult to put that uterus back the right side in. <coughs> Excuse me. So transynamic is something the anesthetists are offering to give at the outset. If you say, I'm taking retained percent of the fear to vein, we'll now say, can I give one gram of transynamic straight up? And that seems to be the way that people go now. Certainly, you can give syntocinon, you can give syntometrin without complications of coexisting hypertension. The prostaglandins are useful, but beware of uncontrolled asthma or poorly controlled. And misoprostol is present. And of course, it works wonders in the third country where there's no fridges to keep the other medications in. But it is probably a third or fourth line drug, um, and unless you're in a situation where you don't have the other things, such as you may be in. I think you can't underestimate the importance of physical compression to try and reduce the bleeding and don't stop. I know you've only got one pair of hands and you may only have half a helper, if not two halves. And so you need to be able to keep the compression up while other people are doing things. And you probably have to take the command and give orders, whether it's the husband helping you or whoever who's come from the ward. Putting the bladder in helps the uterus contract, as I've said. A bakery brune can be used whether you've got a placenta inside still or not. If you have to go to theatre, what they will do if you aren't able to get good hemostasis is to consider stepwise suture of vessels. They're called O'Leary, b compression interrupted sutures, or ultimately a hysterectomy. Um, and in major units, you can be lucky and have an interventionist on who could embolize the uterine artery. But it's pretty dangerous taking them down to radiology when they're bleeding. Here's a picture of bimanual compression. And um, the midwife who did this in the helicopter from Omaru the other day told me that she was sore in the arms and hands for days afterwards, it's, it takes a lot of energy. If you can't remove the placenta, you have to think it might be stuck, in which case it's a good idea to desist. But having tried and failed, at least it gives people the heads up that they might have to take better steps to get to theater quicker. And this was a result of a SAC report that we make this recommendation because of the delays where people had tried and then they kept trying rather than getting to theater. This is in case you haven't seen a Bakri balloon. Um, it's a very effective way of tamponading from the inside when you've got uterotonics going on the outside. So severe hypertension. It used to be 160 over 100, but we've reduced that internationally to 150 um, as being the systolic pressure at which um, events that can occur due to stats. And so we would treat at this level and certainly would probably treat at 95 diastoric as well. But the, the bad events happen at those kind of levels, 150 over 100. Giving either intermittent IV boluses of labetalol, or if you haven't got it, an oral 100 milligram is preferable. And the HDC have said in the past that if you do not give, as a, even a house surgeon, Rebito of 100 for someone with raised blood pressure, you are negligent. But you have to be aware of dropping it too far too fast. Hydrolazine is less popular these days. You can use it at the same time as Rebito for resistant cases. And you just have to think about caution of using nifedipine at the same time of magnesium sulfate if you've got um, it running for preeclampsia or eclampsia um, prevention. There are UK maternal deaths reported. So the risks for preeclampsia um, are basically, again, people with pre-existing renal or hypertensive disease, which may or may not have been diagnosed, Diabetics, people with big placentas like diabetics and twins, multiple pregnancies, 
and incidentally, rhesus isoimmunization. And people have had preeclampsia before. Then, of course, there's the people who are pregnant um, to a new partner, whether it's first time or multiple time pregnancy. It's the, the first pregnancy of that part is, partner is the great risk because of the new male antigens. Severe preeclampsia can present in many ways. It can be with the headache. It is a multi-system disorder. It can be with the um, liver and hypogastric discomfort. And it can be very vague, especially with help. Eclampsia is, of course, a grand mal seizure. You stabilize the mother. You aim to control the blood pressure and get IV magnesium going with a loading dose as soon as possible. In the States, they still give IM magnesium one gram to each buttock, but IV is probably preferable. And a lot of units around the country now have pre-mixed magnesium, which is a hell of a lot easier than trying to draw it up out of glass vials. It takes 25 minutes for a midwife to set up an infusion using glass vials. It takes three minutes to do it with magnesium sulfate pre-mix, which is made by Baxter's. It's in a 360 mil bag. It's important to monitor the renal function and urinary output because of magnesium toxicity occurring if you've got less than 30 mils of an hour of urine production. You've got to think about having prurary fusions and edema. If you do keep on fitting, consider other intracranial causes and get a CT scan sooner than later. Eclampsia can present with more bizarre things, which are much rarer including acute fatty liver, but help is 10% of all severe eclampsias. You'll remember what it stands for, hemolysis of the red blood cells as they go past those damaged micro um, blood vessels, the damage to the hepatocytes and the transaminases being raised. It's particularly worse in early and in fulminating hypertensive courses, the important thing is that it's often early, so you've got to transfer for the fetal well being and get them delivered. Well, the third thing, sepsis. This can be antepartum or postpartum, it may be vague. The respiratory rate is the key. The temperature can be up or it can be low. The white cells can be up or they can be low. A MUSE chart is essential, and an early warning maternity um, score chart has made a big difference to the rate of success of interventions. The causes, briefly, can be everyday infections that mothers can have, but most commonly, they tend to be from the genital tract or from urosepsis. They can also occur because of um, intra-abdominal causes, such as cholecystitis. The key is to think of it because the women may not look particularly unwell, but they can deteriorate very quickly. And you'll be aware of the whole sepsis bundles, which have made a big difference in the UK to the complications and morbidities of patients. So in summary, you will do your primary survey and your secondary ONG, get the investigations and with the multidisciplinary team that you need, make the plans and follow the treatment protocols, including transfer to a unit that can safely continue the care. So I'm very happy to answer any questions and I'll leave some space for someone else to say something. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. I think it's key to highlight those key um, basic simple points because that's where we do really well and then lead to good outcomes for our woman. Gary, have you got any questions? on your side? There was just one question there about um, Bakari balloons, about whether or not we should hold those Celia in rural centres. I think it's a great uh, idea. I, I always give them to people on the prompt courses that come down. And um, I know they're expensive, but I think it's um, what, $800, somebody said. I don't think they're that expensive. They're more like um, 150 at the most. But we save um, an awful lot of blood product and emergency transfer time if we can get a Bakri balloon in. So I'm a great believer in them. 
You can use over inflated urology balloons, which you probably don't have in your units, but the Bakri balloon is a, a very good way of getting things sorted quickly. I'd be very happy uh, to send one up by a personal courier. That'd be great. It sounds like some other centers do have them, and Vern says that you can put them through the autoclave as well. Yes, I, I, I can't comment on that. <laughs> If centers do have them, my only comment would be that, like most um, tools, they're not as inherent as you think. They're relatively straightforward. But, um, trying to get hold of an old one and just all of you getting your hands on it and actually using it once. And um, But they, they are relatively straightforward. I'm not great, sure of the cost. The great thing is that you can scan them to make sure in the right place. You know, you can correct, check for, and you know, if you've got a bedside scan, you guys can all do scanning. You put them in the uterus, and and if you just a bit put a bit of packing, you know, like a few bandages up the vagina, it just holds it there quite nicely if they've been fully dilated. It sounds like I got that wrong from Vern. He was asking the question if you could put them through the autoclave. But oh, I could. I, I couldn't possibly say yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to do some research on that one and get back to me. Okay, awesome. That's all from you, Gary. Yep, that's great. Okay, so we'll hand over to Brendan and then Celia, you're staying out you to yes. add any pearls as we go through. Okay, thank you. Brendan, all yours. Thanks everyone, it's great um, to be able to present and looking forward to seeing most people who'll be online in a couple of weeks. Um, I'll shift the focus a little bit minor on a couple of cases and, and um, uh, most will be aware, but, but for what it's worth, the, the title rural generalist obstetrician, my role on the coast, we have access to a surgical birthing service, and my role involves some procedural obstetrics, but I've tried to make both cases, I guess, ones I often think of the Westport context for us, even though one of them is set in grey, and they are based on real cases, so thinking both across the, the full gamut of where we work, whether it be into primary care, staffing a, a rural hospital ED, or even on the ward, um, two cases that are that. I'll talk to a couple of handy resources at the end and, and again, hopefully a bit of time for questions. Um, so case one, 32 year old, Miss Yeah, she lives in France, Joseph, that's two hours south of Gray. Um, she works in the tourist industry um, and her partner, Mr. JC of about four years. Um, they're both musicians and, and um, sort of lived a bohemian lifestyle up to the point of falling pregnant. Um, sorry, if the kids are loud, let me know. I didn't bolt the door properly. Sorry, Lucinda. Um, she's Dutch ethnicity. Her partner's a Kiwi. Her parents still live overseas. And I guess um, my role increasingly involves interaction with the LMCs. And this is what you'll see time and again in a story over the, the country is that some of the, the huge distances. So there's a single LMC between Greymouth and Haas, so a distance of about 400 kilometres. Um, and so one of those rang in about 15 weeks and said um, that Miss ER is on cannabis and the indication appeared to be fibro fibromyalgia and chronic pain. We won't delve too much into that, but, but can she do that? What, what can you do really? She's a primate. You meet her first at 24 weeks and for what it's worth, established recently good rapport and I subsequently reviewed her at 28 and 36 weeks on visits down to France. But again, I think just for the point of the case, it's just worth knowing her antenatal journey was chaos. So she had a fight with her partner. Um, she then moved away from France for three or four weeks to Christchurch at about 29 weeks. Um, she moved in with um, some of his family, not his parents, but within a week or two had worn out her welcome there and they didn't want her to stay anymore. And despite, I think when she moved away, some people breathing a sigh of relief, she actually moved back to France in around 35 weeks. She didn't like the first midwife she had, so she changed. And, and even though there was one covering that area, it actually turned out that, that, that one of them had gone on maternity leave and there was a new midwife. The, I just make reference to the fact that no medical issues developed through the pregnancy. Um, so just a slide to reflect some of that without bearing out the detail too much. It's just, I guess you're starting as we always do, no matter what um, history or diagnosis we're making to piece together that, and I've put a star next to the bits that becomes obvious that she's clearly got some risk factors for postnatal or antenatal depression 
family of personal history, relationship dis difficulties, stressful life events, and troubled pregnancy. And, and as Celia highlighted in a slide, and I, I came to make the point in this first case that, that, that you know this is much more common and quite tricky to deal with. So question one, which is not part of the poll we've developed, but that um, taking away from the grey context for a second, and when Waira or somebody asked, can she deliver in a primary unit? Is she okay to deliver in, in your rural hospital? And, and I, I put this up as much to, to link back to the first slide that it, it makes little difference what you actually specifically say, she's gonna deliver where she's gonna deliver and she's um, gonna turn up on your doorstep. It, 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 she's, she, she wasn't gonna take advice as to where she could deliver. She was gonna stay at home basically. She ends up delivering in Greymouth. She came in, in labor, but early labor. Um, she required an epidural. We have an epidural service in Gray, but went on to a subsequent spontaneous vaginal delivery. There were comments made that it was very distressing for, for everyone involved during the labor, but uh, a good outcome in the end for baby. She returns home to friends. There was some discussion again about whether they'd go and live over in Christchurch and do a different living arrangement, but they moved back to friends. In a, in a wonderfully supportive move, the in-laws come to stay in a small two-bedroom house to support the postnatal period. Um, and the visits by the midwife, who again, making the point that she certainly, I think, uh, um, had got on much better with her and a different approach to some of her, I guess, wider psychosocial issues. Um, the first six weeks was relatively um, straightforward. In the mix, and, and, and again, highlighting with this case, the multitude of, of health professionals at a distance that all of us will deal with in our various role. There's a rural nurse specialist who's new to an area. Um, the expectations when you look at the at roles, and this will happen across the country, I know, but certainly they conduct some of the well child visits without much formal training in this. She went and saw about six to seven weeks. You have a phone consult to, to try to diagnose whether the child's experiencing colic or what they've got. I myself went down and saw it around eight weeks, everything going well. Job well done, walk away feeling chuffed. But two weeks later, Tom Barry's on the ED shift in grey and the real nurse specialist has had a, a prime call out. And it, it becomes increasingly clear that probably even, even leading up to my visit, but certainly in the two weeks subsequent, um, a, real, a real winding up of general behaviour. And what had happened this night was a single comment about um, how she should win the baby and that and, and that was enough for her and the baby to take off and she hasn't been seen for about 30 minutes. And, and so I guess to bear out what you're dealing with in a case two hours away on the end of a phone and somebody seeking advice, the concerns and management priorities and like silly slide that this isn't the specific poll but just what's going through your head and a diagnosis. And, and I think the, the point perhaps to the latter one is you're too far and don't have enough information to make the right diagnosis. But again, the analogy of say somebody with a thunderclap headache, you have to assume that potentially in the mix here is a is a postpartum psychosis and to work towards that as the, as the worst case scenario of what you're dealing and your management plan to be based around that is, is where, where we want to go. Again, without um, talking generally too much, but to link some of that, it, it is common. It is the, the prevalence is similar to to the um, to women in general, about twelve to thirteen percent. As has been highlighted, um, it is the most um, common cause of maternal mortality in research, resource rich countries, um, and that was a statistic similar to what you saw. So, in that period of the sixty six deaths, nearly half are related. The, the, the less severe cases of postnatal de depression, a lot resolve spontaneously, but a, a number have symptoms in a year. And I think this is the key thing that a number of us have seen emerging now, that there is pretty good data that that has an interference with the mother-infant relationship. And the worry is, as it's played out in this case, the ability, as your symptoms get worse, your ability to care for that child becomes significantly impaired. And I've underlined the last point, you know, in an hour long, but I think sometimes if we, I, I in many ways find both in this sphere, but probably in general terms, it's um, this case will hopefully have an endpoint that you can sort of manage, but it's sometimes the mild to moderate illness where we have the greatest difficulty, probably in a lot of areas, but certainly in the rural setting, dependent on the support you have. How do you manage someone that's not unwell enough to need acute intervention or acute assessment? 
but you are really worried about it. And I think that's probably something we see time and again. So from this ER in this case, it's trying to engage her at a distance. You're not going to clearly that the actual priority is to get her to somewhere where she can be assessed. And that will probably need a, a police, uh, depending on how willing she is. Clearly the ambulance could, but there's logistical problems for all of you, I assume. And certainly for us, it would take potentially three ambulance transfers to transfer by road from friends. The sort of non-urgent things, just remembering that sleep deprivation is, is the key risk factor here. And sometimes you may need to give people help with that, with something such as Zoplicone. And, and time and again, and it's brought out here, but just remembering that that's what we're looking at, the safety of the infant and mother here. Um, this last slide, and there is a poll here because I'm interested. So ultimately, Miss ER in this case ended up transferred to Greymouth where she was assessed. We, we are fortunate, and this is one of the questions I asked below that we can sort of share, that we have access to an acute psychiatric assessment team who were able to admit her to the hospital in Grey and transfer her to a mother-baby unit in Christchurch. Um, it's about trying to destigmatize at that stage and emphasize its values, um, and, and as soon as possible, get help from those who are used to doing it more often. And I, I guess partly as we discussed it in a, um, partly thinking about this as an endpoint in which you may have to manage a case like that. I, um, I'll, I'll flick to you, Rory, because you'll be the, the one with the knowledge how to show this up, but we've got a bit of a poll as to how far away for people who have joined us tonight, your nearest mother baby unit is. And we've decided in town is what we're talking about, who has access to support from an acute psychiatric team to assess any patient, but clearly in this setting, I'm talking about someone with fairly severe postnatal depression or postnatal psychosis. Okay, thanks, Brendan. Um, and one of the key reasons we brought, brought in this case was just the sheer uh, impact that mental health and suicide have on our women in New Zealand when they're pregnant or early postpartum. So that's for the first six weeks postpartum as the number one cause of maternal mortality. Uh, and I certainly wasn't aware of that statistic. Uh, until earlier this year, and I just think that's really keen to highlight. Um, we were really keen to highlight that, and um, the importance of asking all our women that when you see them. That's including for our GPs at the six-week visit. Okay, everyone filled it out there, Rory. Uh, I think there were 22 votes. Uh, half have a maternal baby unit 101 to 300 kilometres away and 64% have in-town support from an acute psychiatric team locally, 36% don't. Lucinda, will I um, just carry on and we maybe even at the end, of, really interesting there, and again, at the risk of half empty, a third of people who don't have access is a lot more than I would have thought to a local team to assist them, but intriguing. Yeah, and um, we might just hand over to Gary and see if he has any questions. Uh, so no, there's, there's another question there. There's one sort of question about sepsis. We can backtrack to at the end if we've got time. Yep. The only, uh, the only thing, um, Brendan, that um, Jeremy, Mark, and myself want to know is where you got that really good photo on the slopes of Tappy at the start. <laughs> you, can, you can tell us at the end. <laughs> you might charge me. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't credit it, did I? You've got to be very careful. So. <laughs> <laughs> might be soon. So JV's on now. A couple of weeks later. Um, even though it's abnormal, access to care is limited in France and um, she's shown with a, 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 an infection and part of her question is whether she can have another baby. And um, I guess just a note on future pregnancy planning, the long and short is as you'd expect, she is at high risk of future episodes, but clearly it's not contraindicated. The magic number of a year, which seems to be the, the, the number that we use for a few things in obstetrics, so symptom free if she can be, but that's a pretty high number when you think about it, a chance of recurrence, one episode of psychosis rather than just um, postnatal depression, but postpartum psychosis increases to about 50%. Treating the insomnia early and close monitoring. So again, if, you're, if you don't have a local team, referring to them early and having them involved in a plan would be pretty key. I'll just keep on moving through, aware of time, and, and as Gary said, we'll, we might have questions at the end. So case two, um, this time, you've taken a locum in Westport, 
say 40 on a Friday night, you know, arrived a couple of hours before, and this time June's come in. She's a grand multiple G7P5, 38 year old. She's 27 weeks pregnant, pretty limited antenatal care. She lives in a house bus, a husband and five children. And she's presented as she's noted fairly significant amount of blood on her when she's white and has subsequently passed two fairly large clots. She describes moderate pain around her back and into her lower abdomen that's coming in waves. But she doesn't have any periods where she's completely pain free. And while you link bits of the cases together, I'm not just completely making it up. You have in a place like Westport, you have two sort of midwives in town and, and most, as you'd be aware, home births require two people. And so at this point in time, the day you've taken the, the locum, they're, they're both at a home birth in Karamea. So uh, I think everyone would agree that there's some assessment and decisions to be made right then. Celia's made some of these points, but it's worth making good ones time and again. An APH with significant bleeding is an obstetric emergency. And again, I don't need to tell people that this is one of those terrible situations where a couple of lives are at risk. So understanding your, your health service capability, what we do as, as teams day in, day out, and the old adage of if it is safe to, to transfer in utero, that's what everyone wants to do. But there's some caveats. Resuscitation, which we've touched on before in the introductory slide. But the point that's worth remembering, not in the, the case I've presented, but that there are unfortunately sometimes even with this nightmare scenario where you can't transfer. So it will vary from place to place depending on how far you are. But essentially if delivery is imminent or if she's very actively laboring as you can be doing with a severe antepartum hemorrhage, in a way you're stuck with managing the patient then and there and trying to get resources to you. And I think the other issue is trying to ring around and, and mobilise whatever you can in town. Um, they talk about uh, consulting with obstetric and paediatric clinicians. You're clearly going to be doing that, but you're probably going to be getting your support first if, to, if imminent delivery is, is around. And you've rang around in this situation and there's a couple of experienced people. While we are focusing on uh, obstetric emergencies for today, I thought it is worth making a few points then about this little bub because um, this may be the situation you're in. Just keeping in mind with less than 28 weeks gestation, if you have a couple of little extra things, if you can with the resuscitation, if you have access to some sort of bag or plastic bag, they do ideally like to deliver to keep them warm. Um, your laryngoscope blade is going to be smaller and you're not going to remember those numbers. I appreciate but just there for reference. The old teamwork thing in amongst all of this will still be the most important thing. And I put these in italics because if you manage to think of them, you do. And you may or may not have access to them in, in some of the places you are. But, a, but an APH with a baby potentially delivered, the baby will potentially be anemic. So if you have access to blood, there's two people who may need it. And the, the second poll I've got for the night is just a little thought about this. And I, I think in many ways to highlight the difficulties when a comment like this is thrown in, counsel the woman, baby, what to expect. And just... Do people know sort of broad terms what the approximate survival rates for a, a baby delivered at 28 weeks is in 2020 and for those delivered in the center without a NICU? So yeah, the, the majority have one. So, so 90% is, the, is the, about 89 to 90% is, is what's quoted. And not just being facetious, because it is a question that, that in many ways, um, Jenny asked in the chat box before, I don't think we'd have a clue what the survival rate for a 28 week for those delivered without. The numbers would be so small. Um, what exactly? But clearly, we know that being transferred is a risk factor being delivered in a centre that, that doesn't have the resources to call on about 15 people at once will be trickier. So I don't think we know. Um, and it's just to highlight that when a comment like that to counsel somebody, it's hard to know. But I think you'd want to be setting an expectation that this is something you're not used to doing and, and that the team will do what they can. And I think, uh, again, that's another whole discussion I appreciate, but giving a number is probably of more use in a bigger centre where you're starting to weigh up what you're going to do. This child needs to be delivered one way or the other. And whether it's be 70% or 80% survival is probably neither here nor there for that individual who's about to, about to come into the world. Um, but back to the case more as it, uh, as it was presented, and this is the more common situation we'll be in, whether it be preterm labour or an APH. And, and just the, the things, I guess, to think over, which 
I'm not sure how often people present in a, and, and hence why we wanted to sort of do it in a webinar context is where this baby's best transferred to. And I guess the point I'd say to this with the Westport example is this is a 28 week old infant. So it may not be the nearest though, depending on how much again, somebody's bleeding and how compromised mum is, but you ultimately would, would like to save two transfers. You'd like to get this baby to one of the units that looks after 28 week old infants. Um, a few notes that again, your paediatric team will be talking to you about this or, or, or you're retrieving, but um, steroids shouldn't delay transfer, but most of us will be sitting around waiting but if the patient does become stable. And so no, advice would normally be to give some steroids depending, um, clearly the team will make a decision about whether delivery is needed to be expediated or not at the other end, but it would be very rare you would have if you were transferring for an APH. Um, a note about tocolysis, which again, may be a concept people are familiar with or not, but essentially the is a common one to try to stop people laboring, but certainly bleeding is one of the, the real contraindications to that. And, and, and again, hopefully your retrieval teams would, would, would know that. And I've just thrown that in, made the point when we went through last night with Lucinda, there's um, people now use mag sulfate for neuroprotection for real little bubs, but it's got to be with an imminent time within birth. And again, learning the protocol, how much to give. If they were just delivering, you're delivering, and the tertiary centre can give it when the baby arrives if they're going to deliver mum. Key messages which match what Celia said, and so I guess we'll leave some time for questions if we can, but essentially this is associated with significant risk, treating anemia, and I think the point in the middle is probably the main one. An APH is one, unlike PPH, where it's all sitting there in front of you and quite obvious, it can often be underestimated. A, a different situation I appreciate, but an APH that we delivered in Greymouth last week, similar type um, clinical picture during label, and she, she lost about 800 mils within literally 20 seconds of delivering. So, you know, the blood was sitting in behind the in behind the bub and when she delivered it, it straight away. This is the reference to a couple of things. Um, I think more and more of you are familiar in using SIMS and some of these, I guess, a plug to think about some of these obstetric ones. The Ashburton team um, joined us last week and certainly um, formal prompt itself is quite a big deal. But I guess a couple of things I'd say is there's some resources there, but this here is particularly useful. I know in this era of doing things online, there's lots of resources where, but if you are feeling motivated to look at sort of breach delivery or a shoulder dystocia, there, this Prompt Maternity Foundation has some really detailed and pretty good YouTube um, material there that you can have a look and work through with your teams. Some time for questions at the end. You got, great. Thank you, Brendan. Um, Gary, have you got some questions there? Yeah, there was one question there. We've heard about the role of tranexamic acid and PPH, but what, what about an APH? Does it have a role, Celia or Brendan? I would say yes, if you're doing a delivery, um, we might be more hesitant to give it until we knew what was going on, like if it was a concealed hemorrhage, rather like the one that Brendan mentioned. I think that if a woman's compromised, she's going to get delivered and would give transdynamic. That would be my take as well. I don't think it's part of the protocol when you're still sort of hovering, waiting what you're going to do. Um, but certainly if delivery is imminent and she's got ongoing bleeding, uh, as with most situations, the earlier you get it in the better. But um, it's, I think it's more, clearly the PPH scenario is, is certainly where it's more aligned to the protocols. There was one there about, oh, we've answered that, haven't we, Gary, with the steroids for mum? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But there was, can I say that there was a very good New South Wales rural study about inborn and outborn, and it showed about a 10-15% difference in um, fetal outcome, whether they were born in a tertiary unit or one with a NICU, or whether they're outborn in a small hospital. And that was presented at the MOE course um, two years ago. So like you say, it's not going to make a difference to the individual, but overall, it's much better to get them transferred. Celia, um, in terms of your, or, and or Brendan, you know, in terms of the improving 
um, maternal mortality rates over the last three years? What do you think has been an impact there? Um, personally, I take New Zealand statistics with a pinch of salt because it's such small numbers. And, you know, like with the amniotic fluid embolus having that big surge, we probably won't see one for a wee while again now. Um, it's very hard, so I think we have to take the longer view, which is why we do the three-year rolling. I, I think that we have improved a lot with things like prompt course. There's much better coordination with you guys working in the periphery and rural places and getting people transferred appropriately. And I think there's better working together with LMCs who are working remotely and bigger units. I think actually I'm very positive about all the changes I've seen in the last decade. Great. I know, but I'm such an optimist. <laughs> we like optimism. Brendan, have you got anything else you want to add? No, it clearly uh, haven't had as much to do with both the gathering of the statistics or, or their analysis, but as Celia said, and that's like a, um, I made reference where, uh, to Jenny's question before, the, the ministry release a huge amount of data around um, maternal outcomes of which the maternal mortality, as you'd hope, is very small. But we see that data, because we're such small numbers on the coast, our confidence interval for things like that is just so large. So it is hard when you've got such um, broad data sets, but it is useful that, that they do three-year rolling statistics for a number of these. So at least, the, the, I guess, the, the, what they're collecting is a, is a little bit larger cohort. Right. Yeah. Now, I, we two have two very experienced people here in terms of obstetrics. So if anyone's got any questions, burning obstetric questions, whip them in that chat. And because um, we have got a couple of minutes that we can ask. And um, this is the opportunity. Type fast, team. Lucinda, there was one other question um, I was backtracking a little bit back to when we were talking oh, about, yep. um, about, about sepsis. Mm -hmm. um, Celia, Celia, and that was about how to interpret what cell counts when there's normally a, a physiological neutrophilia um, to a certain extent with, uh, with pregnancy and how you try and interpret them in, the, in those circumstances. Yeah, and, and with um, delivery as well, you get a leukocytosis. So I think you look at the differentials, but we basically don't look at that as much as the CRP, and that's going to be up if you've had a delivery as well, or if you've had a, anything happening to you. But we basically look at the respiratory rate. That is the bottom line. The respiratory rate is the differentiating factor between someone who's going off septically and whose everything else looks relatively normal. Great. Those, those questions are piling in a bit there now, Lucinda. Oh, uh, look at that. So there's a... Some people are keen on, on a few tips about getting the placenta out, both of you. Good question. Okay, for the placenta, you must guard preventing inversion of the uterus because you could basically call, cause great harm if you would partially or totally invert the uterus with the placenta attached. You won't be able to control the blood pressure or the bleeding. So, you have to guard and keep the uterus with your left hand and pull gently. And if it's not coming, you can gently feel and you can tell if the cervix is trapping it or not. And that might mean it is completely or not separated. It might be incompletely separated. If you've got an ultrasound scan, it's really helpful. Continue to um, provide your uterotonics and gentle um, pressure. I, 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 I'll traction on the cord and, and pressure preventing the uterus um, from going inside out. But the bottom line is that it's either going to come in time within an hour or it's not. And at half an hour, you've got to make a call about what you're going to do. And if she's bleeding, it's a problem. And if she's not bleeding, you can probably wait another half hour. And if you haven't got it out by then with an empty bladder and you've got the IVs and you've got your blood taken and you're ready to transfer, you're probably going to transfer. And I find that not many women deliver their placenta on the way in. So whoever's in the periphery is doing it right. They're sending them in appropriately. All right, thank you. Not a lot more for me. Uh, exactly as Celia said, I think breaking them almost at that half hour, like there's the acutely bleeding 
um, retain placenta and the, the not acutely bleeding. The question that is really tricky, and I, I, I just, I think, I, I don't think it's the sort of like, uh, we get credentialed to do, if that is part of where the question is going to, we get credentialed to do manual removal of placenta. We do it in theatre, we tend to use big vet type gloves, and it is quite tricky. And the first three or four times you do that, massaging the placenta, and as Celia said, it's then trying to pick those ones where it's actually placenta accreta. And I, I know it's tricky and it might see, but I, I just, I, I haven't heard of sort of any way other than transfer in terms of sedating and removing them, say in, a, in an ED bay. Uh, I think while that would be less traumatic if they were a procedural sedation, it, I think you'd have to be fairly comfortable with having done the procedure a few times for a manual, for the next step, the manual removal of placenta. I don't know if you've got any comments on that, Celia. I, no, I mean, sometimes we get delayed getting to theatre, even you know, in Dunedin, and we find that the, they're still sitting there two hours later. After, you know, we try not to delay them, but when they do, they haven't come out. But when you do go to get them out, they may have been separated, but they're stuck half in that half because the cervix closes down on them. Um, I wouldn't recommend relaxing the uterus with any medications um, because it will bleed. Celia, that's in response to that supplemental question about people asking, someone asking about the use of GGM. Uh, right. Yeah. Um, so GTN I use mostly for getting babies out that are stuck at cesarean sections and deep down because it relaxes the uterus. I wouldn't use it for any retained placenta. We used to use amyl nitrate in the old days, which people sniffed and it's supposed to make the uterus relax. And all it did was make them bleed so that everyone stopped using it, which was similar to GTN. So there's a question about midwives not wanting to give ergometrin. Um, I don't know that they carry it. It has to be kept in a fridge, like oxytocin. Um, they give syntocin as a routine, most midwives will, but there is um, a minority of people who would rather risk the PPH and do it naturally, and which case they don't give oxytocin. Ergometrin tends to be a second line drug for people who are bleeding. There's also a question there just going back to um, bleeding in early pregnancy. There's a question around is this sort of any tips around when it's when it's appropriate to keep patients and 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 when they should be transferred and is there a sort of a gestation which sort of mandates transfer well this is quite relevant we had a case from the country recently where um a, a midwife chose to keep someone around 20 weeks because it was pre-viable and she delivered and she actually had a retained placenta and had to come in the end um, but that was a, a, a conscious choice. And at 20 weeks, if someone's had an abruption and they're going through a miscarriage and you don't want to tra make them travel mid-miscarriage, that's not an unreasonable thing if you've got things like IVs and people around and you're in a potentially a close-by rural hospital. Um, so a lot of the time, if it's feasible, you can actually transfer but you know, the 22, 23, 24 weeker, I think it would be very difficult not to arrange an emergency transfer because of the medical legal aspects, because 22 and a half weeks is now considered potentially viable. If you're talking and I about- I think that, even where we are, uh, I think the limitation most of the time will be how comfortable your nursing staff on the ward will be managing that or your LMC, certainly we, even again with with access to a service, the induction of labours for um, confirmed intrauterine death and around say the the sort of second trimester ones, they can cause a fair bit of distress for staff who may or may not have been involved in that before. Like they're managed um, in a in a bigger hospital. I don't know if they need the same thing, but they're managed specifically on a gynaecology ward in Christchurch where they also deliver sort of medical terminations. So there's a degree of awareness and I guess for one of a bit term used to what the process will be and what that baby will look like. I know that 
as I said, the one or two cases I've been involved with, majority of staff are okay, but but even uh, like on a surgical ward, a couple of the nursing staff were were, were quite shaken up by it. So so that and I know people know that, but that will be your other question. What are your resources locally um, like to to manage that? Any more, Gary? Um, no, I think I think that's pretty much covered it. Uh, thanks, both. Yeah, great. I mean, I think the recurring themes there come out as communication and knowing what your local environment has within your unit, hospital and beyond. So unless Celia and Brendan have got any other things, they would love to impart burning pointers. No, I'd just um, follow Brendan and say that prompt courses are good fun and we love people coming to our prompt courses because you bring a whole new dimension of understanding. Go rural. Okay, team. Well, I would like to, on behalf of all of us here this evening, just say a very, very large thank you to Celia and Brendan for the time that you've put in and for your knowledge and expertise um, that you have given to us and also to the women of rural NZ. And if you've got, I would love feedback. So if you put it at the bottom of that survey or send it to my email, that would be greatly appreciated. We've got several other webinars coming up this year. There's going to be a pediatric one in June, an end of life choice act one in about August. And then in November, we're going to have one looking at uh, equity sort of issues. And then of course, there's the conference in October that I'm working through. And yes, the link will be coming on the advertising. I am just a little bit slow on that. So I apologize. Uh, next week's mission. Okay, so um, Kakitia Noor. And thanks, thanks also to Gary and Rory for your technical skills. Au revoir.